Well, it has been said that we are born with two meters. A hypocrisy meter, I mean, early on, as kids, we can spot hypocrisy like a mile away, can't we? We're also born with a justice meter. I mean, we don't have to be taught justice. It's kind of just built into us. And this is discovered early on, right? When, when a sibling or a friend takes something that belongs to us, oh, our sense of justice kicks in. We become righteously indignant. And we want justice fast. We discover this early on when a sibling or a, or a friend gets something that we want or, or think that we deserve. And we say, that's not fair. But as we get older, that, that meter, that sense, that intuition of justice builds. If we or, or someone near and or dear to us suffers unfairly, we, we want justice. If, if we or someone near and dear to us is treated unfairly, we, we want justice. If we or someone near and dear to us dies unjustly, we want justice. The list could go on. Injustice is, is devastating. And, and when earthly justice fails us, as it often does, that's also devastating. But where, where does the sense of justice come from? Where, where does our justice meter that's built into us come from? Well, it's built into us by the one who is the author and sustainer of perfect justice. So with that, please open your Bible to the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk is toward the latter part of the Old Testament. It is in a section of the Old Testament called the Book of the Twelve. Today we're going to be continuing our series through this book titled, Living by Faith. If you do not have a Bible with you, that's okay. There's one in the pew near you. You can find Habakkuk on page 785. 785. Today, we're going to be specifically looking at Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 6 through 20. And that passage can be found on page 786 of that blue pew Bible. If you're new to reading the Bible, the large numbers are the chapter numbers. The small numbers are the verse numbers. And we are a people under God's Word, so it is good for us to be in God's Word. Amen? And so you'll be helped. We'll all be helped to keep our Bibles open to this passage this morning. Please listen as I read from Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 6 through 20. Shall not all of these take up their taunt against him with scoffing and riddles for him and say, Woe to him who heaps up what is not his own! For how long? And loads himself with pledges. Will not your debtors suddenly arise and those awake who will make you tremble? Then you will be spoil for them because you have plundered many nations. All the remnant of the people shall plunder you. For the blood of man and violence to the earth to the cities and all who dwell in them. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house, to set his nest on high, to be safe from the reach of harm. You have devised shame for your house by cutting off many peoples. You have forfeited your life. For the stone will cry out from the wall and the beam from the woodwork respond. Woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city on iniquity. Behold, is it not from the Lord of hosts that people labor merely for fire and nations weary themselves for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Woe to him who makes his neighbors drink. You pour out your wrath and make them drunk in order to gaze at their nakedness. You will have your fill of shame instead of glory. Drink yourself and show your uncircumcision. 
the cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you, and utter shame will come upon your glory. The violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you, as will the destruction of the beasts that terrified them. For the blood of man and violence to the earth, to cities and all who dwell in them. What profit is an idol when its maker has shaped it? A metal image, a teacher of lies? For its maker trusts in his own creation when he makes speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, Awake! To a silent stone, arise! Can this teach? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Let's say that together. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless the hearing and applying of his word to our lives this morning. Lord, your word is a delight. It is good and it is pure and it is righteous. It's a lamp to our feet and a light unto our path. And so, Lord, we ask that you would illuminate our hearts and minds today. That you would cause us to see clearly your righteousness, your justice from your word. And Lord, we ask that you would also cause us to see your glory in the face of Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, the the bigger picture of of Habakkuk. Let's start there this morning. The book is structured really around a conversation between a perplexed prophet, a dude named Habakkuk in the Hebrew, Habakkuk as I pronounce it, uh, who lived during the 7th century BC. It's a conversation between him and God. And the book begins with Habakkuk lamenting, asking the Lord in chapter 1 verses 1 through 4, how long How long, O Lord, will you sit idly as evil and violence and injustice prevails? Not amongst people out there, but amongst your people, your people of Judah, your people of Israel. How long will your word be numb and paralyzed? And God responds to Habakkuk and says, Oh, Habakkuk, look and see. In chapter 1, verses 5 through 11, look and see what I am doing. For I'm not sitting idly. I'm not. For I'm raising up an unjust people to bring judgment upon my covenant breaking people and to reprove them. And all of that comes to pass. And Habakkuk responds to this in chapter 1, verse 12, through chapter 2, verse 1. He says, but Lord, why? I know that you have ordained all things. You are the rock. You are my rock. I know that you're holy and you're pure. So so why the Chaldeans? Why would you raise up an unjust nation that's even more unjust than your people here in Judah? Why would you do this? And why are you remaining silent? Will evil and treasonous behavior go on forever? And so Habakkuk resolves, chapter 2, verse 1, to watch and wait upon the Lord to answer. And answer he does. In chapter 2, verses 2 through 5, God responds and says, my word will be fulfilled, and it will come at just the right time. Rest assured in that. Because though it seems like evil will never end, that sin will never end, it does have an expiration date. And so listen, and write, Habakkuk, God says. Write this prophecy down, especially write in big, bold letters, the justified by faith shall live, even in the midst of great judgment. Those who are my people by faith, those who have been made righteous by faith, and those who are living faithfully, oh, they will be preserved. Well, it's in light of, of all of this, in light of this grander kind of context that we arrive at our passage this morning. And here God continues to speak to Habakkuk. And here's the big idea, really the, the main idea of, of these verses, those verses that we just read in Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 6 through 20. Here, here they are. Because God is perfectly just, we can place our confident hope in him. 
because God is perfectly just, we can place our confident hope in Him. And the way the passage breaks down is really into two points. First, we're going to look at God's perfect justice in verses 6-13, through 13, and then 15-19. through 19. And then we're going to look at our confident hope in verses 14 and 20. So God's perfect justice and our confident hope. So point one, God's perfect justice. Look with me once again at verse 6 through 13 and then 15 through 19. Let's read these together once again. Shall not all of these take up their taunt against him with scoffing and riddles for him and say, Woe to him who heaps up what is not his own. For how long? And loads himself with pledges. Will not your debtors suddenly arise and those who awake who will make you tremble? Then you will be spoil for them because you have plundered many nations. All the remnant of the people shall plunder you for the blood of man and violence to the earth, to cities and all who dwell in them. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house to set his nest on high, to be safe from the reach of harm. You have devised shame for your house by cutting off many peoples. You have forfeited your life. For the stone will cry out from the wall and the beam from the woodwork respond. Woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city on iniquity. Behold, it is not from the Lord of hosts that peoples labor merely for fire and nations weary themselves for nothing. And then down to 15. Woe to him who makes his neighbors drink. You pour out your wrath and make them drunk in order to gaze at their nakedness. You will have your fill of shame instead of glory. Drink yourself and show your uncircumcision. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you. and utter shame will come upon your glory. The violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you, as will the destruction of the beasts that terrified them. For the blood of man and violence to the earth, to cities and all who dwell in them. What profit is an idol when its maker has shaped it? a metal image, a teacher of lies, for its maker trust in his own creation when he makes speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, Awake, to a silent stone, Arise. Can this teach? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in it. Well, our passage begins, verse 6, Shall not all of these take up their taunt against him with scoffing and riddles for him and say. And, and the, the all of these is referring to the nations, including Judah, that Babylon had conquered or would conquer. And the him in this verse is Babylon himself. And notice what God says here. He pronounces that those who once overthrew, who were once overthrown by Babylon, would be overthrown and would come and sing against Babylon themselves. And they would sing what is called a taunt song. Kind of like a song that you hear at a ball game, that you sing at an opposing team. You can, yeah, you've been to a ball game, I'm sure, and you've sung taunt songs at the opponent. That's the kind of taunt song that we, we see here, that we read of here. And did you notice the repetition in this song, that repeated word that comes in the second part of verse 6? And then verse 9, and 12, 15, and then 19. And that word is woe. It might be translated in your Bible as alas or ha. I prefer the ESV translation, woe. And this is not like a, a surfer like, whoa, dude, hang loose. This is also not like a whoa, like a cowboy whoa, whoa, like you know, pulling the reins of the horse. No, no, that's not what's going on here. This is a woe of judgment. Well, one of my favorite scenes in the Lord of the Rings, uh, in the Fellowship of the Ring, is, is a scene where, the Gandalf, where Gandalf, the wizard, and, and the Fellowship, if you've seen the films, Samwise and Frodo and the others, they're standing in a place called Balin's Tomb in this, in this kind of deep mine in Moria. And in this tomb, Gandalf finds this ancient book that has a story about how Moria was taken over. And Gandalf opens the book and begins to read these doom-filled words. He says, we have barred the gates, but cannot hold them for long. The ground shakes, drums, drums in the deep. We cannot get out. 
And as he's reading, one of the terrified hobbits like, begins to back up, and in a series of really unfortunate events, he ends up tipping this kind of corpse and armor like down this deep well. And the, and the, the, the corpse and, the, and the, the armor is like falling, and it's banging in the well on the way down, and then it hits the, the bottom. And when it hits the bottom, there's this drum beat that begins to sound. Pow. Pow. The drum sends a, a warning that, that, hey, the fellowship has been found and the judgment is coming. And it's not a one-to-one -one perfect correlation. No, no story is. But this is a similar drum beat here. There's a similar drum beat here in, in this passage. There's a, there are five beats, five heavy and deep woes. Woe, 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 and woe. And these woes are meant to warn the reader then and now that judgment is coming. And why would Babylon and unrepentant Judah be judged? Well, let's look at the first woe together in verses 6 through 8. This woe of judgment is pronounced because they, they have heaped up peoples and places and possessions that did not belong to them. This goes back to earlier what's said of the Chaldeans of Babylon back in chapter 1, verse 6, and chapter 2, verse 5. See, they were thieves, and they piled up ill-gotten gain. And they had built wealth through extortion. Extortion being unjust force. And they, as it says in verses 6 and 7, they made pledge after pledge, like debtors make to creditors, that, that the money borrowed would be repaid. And this, this word picture shows us as readers that what Babylon had done was taken things that didn't belong to them. In short, the wealth that they acquired through violent and, and bloody plundering polluted them. And they would be plundered and polluted because of it. The nations would be repaid. There would be retribution. And their self-made security would be lost. Well, this is the first woe. But then there's a second. There in verses 9 through 11. There, God says that Babylon, along with unrepentant Judah, who has come to look like them, will be judged for building a house. Isn't that interesting language? That's the same language that's used in 2 Samuel 7 for, for a dominion and dynasty. See, Babylon would be judged because they had made a, a house, a name for themselves upon the shifting sands of evil. And they had built an empire for their own glory. But the Lord says here that the final result of their kingdom would not be glory upon glory, but what? Shame upon shame. That, that they would be cut off by those that they had cut off. That their very house, their empire that looked high and mighty like a, like a nest that sat above the nations of stone and wood, oh, that very nest would crowd against them. And it would be toppled under the judgment of God. Well, the drumbeat continues in this taunt song with a third woe there in verses 12 through 13. As history shows, when Babylon would conquer a nation, they would pierce the lip of the people that they've, they've conquered, and they would run a, a chain through that, through that piercing, all the way down the line, and then they would push and pull their captives into exile. And those captives would be used for slave labor. See, Babylon built their towns by slave bloodshed and iniquity, which is sin. And side note, slavery is always sin in God's eyes. That's what we see here. But by verse 13, in time, that slave labor would prove vain. It would prove empty and futile. And as it says in Jeremiah 51, 58, which is a, kind of a, a side verse, a parallel verse to this passage, it says, thus says the Lord, that the, the broad wall of Babylon shall be leveled to the ground. Her high gates shall be burned with fire. The peoples labor for nothing, and the nations weary themselves only for fire. Meaning, their labor would only be fuel for what? Destruction. In the end, Babylon violated international rights, and they committed crimes against humanity, against the nations, against Judah, and God would judge them in time. Well, the woes aren't done. There's, there's a fourth woe there in verses 15 to 17. Here we read poetic and figurative language of Babylon's immorality. 
it's a, it's a figurative uh, speech here, as one commentator points out, because Babylon wasn't giving out free drinks to the nations. No, the, their behavior was like a person who deliberately gets someone drunk in order to take advantage of them. Babylon would figuratively force their captives into drunkenness, pouring out wrath and perversion. They would make their captives like a brothel, a place of nakedness, similar to the nakedness that we see in Genesis 9 with Noah or Lamentations chapter 4. But this would only be for a time, for the exposer would eventually be exposed. And their empire of lust and glory would become, verse 16, reversed. It would become an empire of shame, of uncircumcision. In other words, uh, an empire that was unholy and alienated from God. For they themselves would drink of God's cup of wrath. And their violence done to Lebanon, and the reason that Lebanon is singled out here is, is because it was a territory of rich resources that that had been commandeered by Babylon for shameful use. The violence done to Lebanon, including the beasts of the fields, the wildlife there, would also be reversed. For violence would come upon and overwhelm Babylon. Shame and destruction would fall upon them. And their international bloodshed would be avenged. Well, the beat goes on. there with the fifth and final woe. It starts in verse 18 and ends in verse 19. And this is the the very worst of them because this really gets at the heart of the matter. This is the, again, this is the worst of them. For in these verses, we find that Babylon was known for its idolatry. It was known for its refusal to recognize the rule and reign of God. They worshipped false idols and they they worshipped the work of their hands. And they would be judged for it. For here, as it says there in verse 18, what prophet is an idol? And an idol is any person, place, or thing created by man that is worshipped in place of God. That's what an idol is. God says here in these words, what prophet is a wooden or metal thing overlaid with gold and silver that is speechless and has no breath, no awareness, no life? God says, woe to you, Babylon, for trusting, for placing your hope, for placing your faith in a teacher of lies. For placing your your faith in something that is deaf and dead. This judgment is heavy, right? It's it's heavy. It's unrelenting and, and it's, I don't know about you, but it's nauseating to read. It's a dreadful song. But when we look at history, we find that this song reaches a a climax, an earthly climax, a fulfillment point just a century later. What would happen? A a bigger fish, Persia, would come in and take Babylon into captivity. They would wipe them out. Babylon didn't heed God's word. They They were dead to the song and to the drumbeat of these warning woes. And because of that, the Persian Empire would swoop in and be God's instrument of justice against Babylon and bring these woes upon them. And so, beloved, let's, let's make no mistake in the midst of these weighty words that the main point is that God is sovereign even over judgment. And that, that in His sovereignty, He is perfectly just. His justice is perfect. His justice has come to pass, is coming to pass, and will come to pass against all evil, both seen and unseen by man. And His perfect judgment always fits the crime perfectly. And that's our hope. And every injustice committed in this life that has, is, or will be committed is seen by Him, and He will have the final word over it. For he is just and upright, as it says in Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of God's throne, as it says in Psalm 89, verse 14. And where earthly justice fails, and and our sense of justice is often imperfect, short-sighted, and often even self-serving, his justice is perfect. Well, taking this down to the pavement of our lives together. 
both individually and collectively as a local church. Though these woes are aimed at Babylon and at disobedient Judah, they're also aimed at our hearts. These woes are meant to cause us to examine our own lives, our own lives, uh, examine our own hearts, to, to examine where our confidence lies. And so in light of who God is and in light of these, these judgment woes, I, I ask, where, where is your confidence today? Is it in the false security of money or work of your hands or even in earthly justice? Is it in, is it in a self-made empire, the kingdom of you or the kingdom of, of me or the kingdom of us? Is it in your own desires or your, your preferences and them being met? Is it in your, your own personal fulfillment sexually or or emotionally, or politically, or even spiritually? Are you placing your confidence in a person, place, or thing that has become an idol? Has someone or something, I ask you, this is a question, this is a boomerang question, by the way. I call them boomerang questions because they're meant to go out, they come right back to me. It's a question for us. But has something or someone that is, that is meant to be a good gift from God to you, Become God in your life. It could be a a spouse or a child or children, a pet, a job, a dream. It could be sex. It could be media. It it could be a tradition or expectation. It could be a bank account or a title. It could be safety and security. It could be politics. It could even be the church, what it once was, what it is, or what it could be. It could even be a ministry. The list could go on and on and on because in the words of one theologian of old, the human heart is a perpetual idol factory. And what do idols do? They build us up to watch us fall. They promise what they can't deliver for the people and places and possessions of this earth that we make as idols cannot and will not bear the weight of our confidence. They can't. They were never meant to. And in the end, Jesus will not share the throne of your heart. He will not share the throne of our hearts. And so big picture, in light of God's perfect justice, in light of these woes and these these questions, what is the object of your confident hope this morning? And where is your confident hope today? And that brings us to point two our confident hope. Look with me at verses 14 and 20. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And then down at the the end of the chapter, verse 20, but the Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before Him. It may go without saying, but I believe that it's vital to say it, that the song of of woes, as we've already seen and heard, is not simply a warning for Babylon, but it's a warning to all men, all women across all time, and even to all nations to act like Babylon and rebellious Judah. And so it's a song for, for yesterday, but it's also a song for today. And yes, it's a song of deep judgment, but it has, as we just read, two glimpses of true, confident hope. Like a beautiful flower that bursts out from underneath the rubble. Like a a diamond amongst ashes shines forth these two glimpses of confident hope in the midst of catastrophic judgment in this passage. So let's look at those those glimpses more, more intentionally here. First, verse 14. Here, God encourages Habakkuk along with the reader then and now to see the bigger picture. That in contrast to Babylon who has built a fake empire for its own glory and will face judgment and will one day fade away, there will be a day when a better glory, God's glory will fill the earth and the knowledge of Him will cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. Don't you love that imagery? This language, this promise is also affirmed in Psalm 72, verse 19, where we read, Blessed be the Lord's gracious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with His glory. And it's also affirmed in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 9, that one day evil shall not hurt or destroy 
in all the Lord's holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. These verses aren't simply speaking of the earth revealing the glory of God, though it does. Even more, this verse is, is picking up on how there will come a day when God's glory, His majestic presence, will fill the earth. There will come a day when that glory that was mediated through a glory cloud back in the, the tabernacle and the temple, back in Exodus 40 and 1 Kings 8, will be revealed to all. And when that day comes, when would that day come? When would that glory shine forth? Well, when Christ, who as it says in John chapter 1, verses 14, says, the Word became flesh. And that glory shined forth when He came and dwelt among us so that all could, catch this, see His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. See, God's glory has been revealed in the person and work of Jesus, in the face of Jesus. And as John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says in John chapter 2 and, and John chapter 4, Jesus came to, to be God's house, to be His temple, to reveal His glory through the Gospel. For He came and lived the sinless life that we couldn't. He then died the death that we deserved on a cross. And on the cross, Christ absorbed God's justice against evil and sin and death against Babylon Himself for His people. On the cross, Christ took upon Himself every woe, every woe that was aimed at His people, that was aimed at Babylon. He took upon Himself every injustice, big and small. And upon the cross, Christ died under that weight. He was laid in a tomb. But then three days later, He was resurrected in power and glory, conquering sin and death, even conquering Babylon in part. And he did all of this for those who, who repent, who turn from sin, who, who are turning from the, the sins of, of self-glory or self-made kingdom, of, of pride, of all of those things that that we just looked at a moment ago in this passage, and are placing their faith in Christ, who alone is our confident hope. And brother, sister, if you've, if you've done that, if you've repented and believed, if you're living a life of ongoing repentance and belief in Christ, then you have been made a partaker in the glory of God today. Because Christ dwells in you, He is with you, and He is for you today and on the last day. If you have questions, if you're here today and you have questions about any of this, questions about the gospel, I'd love to talk with you. I'll be standing in the back at the door after service today. I'd love to talk with you about hope in the gospel, a better hope and a better glory that can only come in and through Christ in your life. If you're not comfortable talking to me at the door, you reach out to the church office this week. We'd love to connect you with another, another elder here. Or you could talk to someone in the pew who is smiling and nodding as I was sharing that truth of the gospel. We would love to talk with you about this truth. Well, beloved, we must walk away from this passage getting, getting this into our heads and into our hearts. The cross and resurrection of Christ is the place where God's perfect justice and our confident hope meet. And He has brought, Christ has brought light in the midst of darkness. He's brought mercy in the midst of judgment. And He has brought justice in the midst of injustice. And through Him, as 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, God has shown in our hearts the knowledge of His own glory in the face of Jesus. Isn't Scripture amazing? It is all beautifully connected. But here's the thing. Though God's glory has come in Christ, and His glory does fill His people, does fill the church, even today, His, His 
glory fills the church globally and even locally. Local churches like Hillsborough First Baptist Church. We are still waiting and we are still longing for a day where His glory, which is His very presence, will cover the whole earth. We're still waiting and longing for that day. We're, we're longing for that day and that age. And so we're living in what is called the already and the not yet. We're living in the in-between. For Christ has come. Christ has died. Christ has risen. But Christ will also come again. And when He comes, He will finally and fully judge sin. He will finally and fully judge Babylon as we read earlier in Revelation chapter 18. And on that day, as Revelation 21 verses 1 through 2 says, God's glory will outshine all earthly glories in Christ. For there will be a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth will have passed away. And the sea will be no more. For the holy city, the new Jerusalem, will have come down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And on that day, as it says further down in Revelation 21, verses 22 and 23, there will be no temple in the city, for its temple will be the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city will have no need for the sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God will give it light, and its lamp will be the Lamb. Oh, on that day, God's glory will fill the entire earth. Make no mistake. But though we are there in part, all because of Christ, we're not there all ready. So we do, again, live in the already and the not yet. And so how should we live? How should we then live today? Well, I think we should heed God's word in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 20. Here we find that second glimpse of, of confident hope in God. For today, the Lord is in His temple. He is reigning in the heaven today. He sees all. He knows all. He cares. And He sees and knows every injustice. And so here's the good news of this whole passage for us today. Christian brother, Christian sister, here it is. Is that any injustice that you have faced, any injustice, the Lord has seen it. He knows it. And He will, He will answer it in perfect justice. And He will do so on the last day. If you have faced abuse, if you have faced any sort or form of racism, if you have faced any sort of injustice, God knows and His justice will roll down perfectly on the last day. For as Deuteronomy 32-35 says, vengeance is His. And so with confident hope, what are we to do until that day? Going back to that question, how then should we live? Well, by faith, with the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, as we peer through a glass darkly, we and the earth are to keep silent before Him in confident hope and trust in Him. And with the Lord's help, just as Habakkuk does, we are to move from angst and woe to awe and worship. We're to stand in awe of Him who is perfectly just, in reverence and awe of what He has done, what He is doing, and what He will do. Now, this does not mean, HFBC, that we're to remain silent when we see injustice. It's not, that's not what's, what's happening here. This does not mean that we're to put our head in the sand and turn a blind eye to injustice, big or small. As we've seen in this passage, God intimately cares about justice, both out there and in the church. This also doesn't mean that we can't cry out to God in lament as we wait upon Him. Habakkuk has been doing that the whole time, right? It's the very beginning of this book. This does not mean that we can't praise God for who He is 
for the justice that He has fulfilled, even, even already, as we wait upon Him to come again. But it does mean this. Here's what it does mean. It does mean that we wait, and we watch, and we pray, Lord, come quickly, and we leave the results up to God. Because confident hope in God is always paired with confident humility before God. I'm going to say that again. Confident hope in God is always paired with confident humility before God. A humility that reveres Him, that rests in Him, that relies upon Him, and is resolved to heed the warning woes of this passage and is resolved to look to Christ, to His person and work today while we wait patiently with His help for the last day when the entire earth will be the glorious temple of God. When the entire earth will be a better and renewed Eden. And when we will dwell in the glory the presence of our God who is perfectly just forevermore. Oh, in light of that day, where are you you placing your confidence? Where are you placing your hope today? Let's pray. Lord, we praise you for who you are just, and good. And we thank You that You have displayed Your justice in the cross of Christ. And we thank You that that You have displayed Your justice in His Gospel work. So we, we pray that You would fill us with confident hope in You. This is the work that You must do in our lives that we cannot do on our own. And so Lord, we ask, that you would do this for our joy and for your good. That as you do, Lord, that you would give us what we have not. That you would teach us what we know not. And that you would make us what we are not. For your glory. In the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.